Yep, you're good to go. All right. Do, would you like me to just jump in here and start? Um, yes. If you could introduce yourself, that would be great, too. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, my name is John Sheehan. Um, I, uh, I am someone who has about two decades of experience using a, a tool called Lifecycle Assessment to understand sustainability um, of systems related to bioenergy and, and actually in more recent years food and energy systems and how they, how they relate to each other. Um, I think that's me and I'm, or, yep, I will stop that. Um, and at any rate, uh, I got about two dozen, two decades of experience doing this kind of work, but actually only just recently finished doing a PhD at the University of Minnesota, where I kind of broadened my horizons from my engineering background to one that uh, has allowed me to think more about um, natural resources and natural systems. So again, a lot of my experience um, is in energy and environmental issues. Um, most of that around bioenergy uh, while I was at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. Um, and uh, you may recognize that, that fellow uh, in the black and white photo as, uh, sorry about that, um, as um, the uh, former president of the United States who actually started the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, back under, under his administ administration. And it was a thrill for me to be able to go to work for a, a, an institution like that that actually had the, the role of and the name in its title of looking at renewable energy systems. Um, I actually conducted my first life cycle assessment in 1995 while I was at, uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And that was a study in which we compared the life cycle emissions of biodiesel and petroleum diesel uh, and the biodiesel that we were looking at was biodiesel made from soybean oil. Um, very interesting study, really broadened my horizons as a systems thinker and moved me out of the realm of thinking in terms of uh, specific technologies and looking at much broader systems. So let me first give you kind of an ABCs of what life cycle assessment is. Um, and. Uh, the first sort of elevator story version, you know, the 30-second version, describe what it is you do to somebody uh, when you meet them on an elevator. Um, a a lifecycle system uh, analysis is one in which we take a particular product or a service delivered by that product, and we look at it from the perspective of its cradle-to-grave impacts. Um, really, that means looking at all of the flows coming into the system from the planet, if you will, from the Earth, um, and all of the net flows leaving that system, usually these are wastes and things that we are then asking the planet to deal with. And a typical product uh, system um, would start with what materials need to be extracted from the planet in order to uh, uh, make this material. Um, it might include looking at all of the inputs and outputs of processing that that raw material, um, maybe intermediate production steps and final final production steps and end use, and then an ultimate end of life, and that can be something that includes recycling. Sometimes when people talk about the life cycle assessment of recycled materials, they talk about it instead of cradle to grave as being cradle to cradle. Um, for those of you who are kind of nerdy um, thermodynamicists and um, uh, interested in that kind of thing, basically what we're talking about is taking low entropy inputs from the planet. Low entropy means they're high value, useful materials, um, and then asking the planet to deal with them in a high entropy state after we've finished using them. Um, and so on a life cycle basis, we're really trying to understand the burdens that we're placing on the planet. There is a noisy example of um, a life cycle system for, oops, oh, let me try this again. Yeah, um, a, a life cycle system um, drawn out for you for a paper clip. Um, basically for a paper clip, you need to start from 
uh, taking iron ore out of the out of the ground. Um, you need to do the material processing of turning that into steel. Um, intermediate production of the steel wire, and then an actual paper clip paper clip making step where you're doing the bending and et cetera to make the final paper clip. And then there's an end use for that paper clip. And in fact, the end use generally has pretty low impact on the environment since it's basically usually holding together a bunch of pieces of paper. Um, and then you can you can recycle that paper clip, send it back into the steel making process um, where uh, as a material it gets reused, or it could end up in a landfill. Now the problem is that every one of these steps actually has its own sets of inputs and outputs that have to be taken into account. And if you want to look at the life cycle system um, sort of from the point of view of, of the fine print, here's what it looks like. Um, basically, you don't necessarily just have one intermediate product that's going into the system. There can be multiple intermediate products. Think about all of the intermediate products, for example, that go into making an iPhone. Um, each of these can have their own supply chain and each of these supply chains has natural resource demands and flows back into and out of the environment. And then, as I say, at each stage along the way, energy and resources are consumed, um, things are emitted to the environment, and you need to take all those into account. So basically what I like to say is that life cycle assessment is nothing but a very big bean counting exercise. Um, it's basically just trying to take into account everything you can as broadly as you can in the definition of the system. So a little bit of history about life cycle assessment. Um, I always like to start with this question and I'm kind of hoping somebody will type in an answer because I'm, I'm looking at the chat window here. Um, does anybody have any idea what the first life cycle assessment ever done in the United States was about? Um, what, what kind of issue it looked at? Um, this was 1969 was when it was done. Um, the picture that I'm showing with the question mark is not a hint, by the way, um, but uh, just curious. I will wait about 10 seconds and then move on. Oh, I, heard, I, heard a, I heard a bell. Asphalt, nuclear power, good guesses. Uh, energy systems, uh, asphalt probably uh, coming from somebody who's looking at my picture of a road and I, I didn't mean to mislead about that. And there are lots of big picture issues like that that should have been done. But here is what the life cycle, the first life cycle was. It was about a bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, this was a big issue for Coca-Cola in the late 1960s and into the early 1970s. They were very interested in moving away from reusable, recycled um, glass uh, bottles to using throwaway plastic. And the issue for them and um, really came down to the fact that solid waste was one of the biggest issues in the late 1970s or late 1960s and early 70s. We were worrying about the fact that we were throwing away so much trash that we were that we were filling up what capacity we had for landfilling all this waste. So Coca-Cola was eager to look at this question from a life cycle perspective, um, mostly in effect. I'd like to buy the Does anybody world remember that commercial? Um, furnish it with love. I won't make you sit through that whole thing, um, but this was the era of the new. Um, the new, basically, Earth Day thinking. Uh, environmental awareness was something that was well on the rise. Um, and basically, Coca-Cola cherishes more than anything else its brand name. Um, and they were motivated by the desire to protect that brand name and to let people know that they were good citizens as a company. And they actually had full page advertisements in uh, various magazines actually stating that, um, hey, listen, we're not going to just jump into this switching to plastic bottles uh, or switching into um, uh, you know, cans that are throwaway versus the 
uh, the washable, reusable glass bottles. We're not going to go into that without being responsible and actually doing a study and understanding the full implications of this kind of change in the materials that we're using. Now they ended up concluding, not to anybody's surprise, that the benefits of the life cycle um, for the plastic bottle outweighed the benefits of using glass. Um, now this was probably an answer that they wanted, um, but it's the first example of how I think life cycle assessments mostly get used and that is to promote one option or another as being good or bad. Um, it is the least useful way um, that you can use a life cycle assessment but it's the one that's had the most um, application if you will um, over the history of life cycle assessments. Um, it, things got quiet after uh, in the life cycle world after Coca-Cola uh, did its study in, in early 1970 um, and the issues particularly around solid waste re-emerged in the late 1980s um, for those of you who might remember this poor garbage barge um, that basically uh, could not find a home it kept going up and down the east coast uh, between the mid-Atlantic and New England mid-Atlantic and the southeastern coast trying to find a place to drop off all of their garbage. Um, and basically this lit a fire under this solid waste issue once more um, and that was uh, something that happened at the same time that products um, were shifting to being even more disposable. And that leads to the kind of the next big issue for uh, life cycle assessment. Um, okay, if uh, Coca-Cola bottles were the first big study, the second set of studies that really made a lot of um, noise um, were studies of uh, disposable diapers. Um, which is better, the disposable diaper um, or the cloth diaper? Um, and believe me, there was a lot of money thrown at trying to understand this. So one study came out from the American Forest and Paper Association um, declaring that disposables are environmentally superior to cloth diapers. Now you, all you have to do is look at who did the study to understand um, why that was sort of the bent that their solution, uh, their, their life cycle study took. Um, but the people were not to be um, uh, outdone by that. Believe it or not, there's a National Association of Diaper Services um, who hired their own consultants to do another life cycle study um, to determine that in their view cloth diapers were environmentally um, better than um, disposable diapers. A.D. Little was hired by Procter & Gamble to look at the disposable issue and of course they found that, that these were better. And the theme in all of these issues um, as they're being looked at is that these are studies that are being done by people without the kind of transparency that's required of a life cycle assessment to really understand what they mean when they say that one product or one service um, delivered one way is environmentally more sound than another. Um, if you focused on disposable diapers in terms of their solid waste implications, you would come out with a negative result. If the emphasis of the study was on how much energy is consumed, um, cloth diapers did not look good. Um, the amount of uh, water uh, and energy that's consumed in washing and reusing the diapers was quite substantial. So there on an energy basis you could argue that, um, that the cloth diapers were not, were not as good. And if you think uh, actually this debate is over, um, it's not. There is still a big uh, argument going on about which is better. Um, and there is actually kind of a grassroots group that calls itself the Real Diaper Association, which um, done its own sustainability analysis recommending cloth diapers over disposals as environmentally more sustainable. Now I actually haven't looked at this study, but again, it's one of those confusing contradictory claims among many um, that uh, people end up having to deal with and this has been a major problem for the over the course of the history of doing life cycle assessments. So 
one of the interesting things was that the International Standards Organization, known as ISO, um, they're uh, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, actually developed a set of standards for how you should conduct a life cycle assessment. And I'm going to talk about what those standards are and what they now say must go into a properly done life cycle assessment. Um, the first issue is the obvious one that you can see from these previous cases, and that is they must be transparent. People must be able to see exactly what system was studied, what assumptions were made, what things were measured, um, so that people can have an ability to actually judge uh, the outcome of the study. More importantly than I think, and maybe related to the transparency, is the idea that if you're going to do a life cycle assessment that's going to relate to something like sustainable development, you have to have stakeholder engagement in the process, not only um, in reviewing the study, but in the design of the study up front. And this has been my big soapbox in life cycle assessment over my career, that 99.9% .9 of the life cycle assessments that make it into the media, certainly, um, or make it in, even into the peer-reviewed liter uh, scientific literature, um, are all studies that do not allow for this upfront engagement of stakeholders in the design. And I'll actually show you an example of a life cycle that I've done uh, in yeah, which sure. is that stakeholder engagement. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> um, okay, so let me step into the process that has been defined by the International Standards Organization. Um, and I want to contrast how they view doing a life cycle, and frankly how I view doing a life cycle, with the more traditional approach of how science is conducted. Um, so science usually starts in its own little world in maybe an academic institution, maybe a corporate uh, research uh, group, where, wherever that may be, um, and they start out with something they think is interesting and worth studying. Um, they have a hypothesis about um, one technology versus another or some particular issue. Um, from that hypothesis, they come up with their own experimental design. They go out and they collect data in a highly specialized approach, um, which is effectively what the scientific method is, um, and then put that information out into the scientific community where it does get peer reviewed. And that's, you know, that's a, a real positive side of the, the traditional approach to science is that other people get to look at this and make judgments about how solid the information is. But from the point of view of the public at large, this is a process that feels very unilateral. Um, somebody at some point along this process of doing the scientific investigation has decided what is interesting and what is worth studying, how to do that study, um, and conducts the research. Um, this is basically um, problematic for several reasons. Um, one, I don't mean to, to smash or come down on the scientific method. It's, it's very appropriate in the places um, where it is used. Um, it's a hypothesis-driven process that leads to a framing of questions that I call um, the ceteris paribus framing of questions. Um, what do I mean by that? What's a good experimental design? So you have a hypothesis that some particular factor, some particular change um, is going to have a certain effect on a system. So what do you do? You design an experiment in which you freeze everything else that's going on in the system and you make the one factor change so that you can determine its effect. You measure that change, you assess that effect, and you put that out into the literature. Um, that's great, um, except that that's not how the world works. Um, the world doesn't work in a ceteris paribus mode in which everything is frozen. Um, it's actually a much more complex system than that. And more importantly, it's not how we should be making decisions about new options for technology or new options for delivering services to society. Um, in a complex world, we need to be looking at a much more robust sort of systems perspective. And so where I think ISO ended up having serious heartburn with uh, you know, the conventional way of doing the, the life cycle study, the kind of one-way flow I talked about, is that if you're lucky, um, so that scientific information 
finds its way filtered through the media, um, maybe even presented in less than you know objective ways, and delivered to interested parties who are actually trying to make decisions, people who are trying to develop public policy, strategic planning, and maybe most importantly of all, people making individual choices. Um, there is a huge chasm between how that process of collecting the data was done and how that can be used by the people making choices. So ISO established a process in which they said, look, the goal and there are four big activities that go into doing a life cycle. You have to do a goal and scope definition for that study. This is where you're really sitting down and saying to people, what is it you want to know? Um, there's the bean counting exercise I talked about, going out and finding all of the data that you can uh, on the system, um, and then translating that into terms that people can relate to in terms of uh, the actual uh, sort of impacts or value-laden um, impacts associated with, with what you found in the life cycle flows. And there's a whole process of interpreting all along the way. And the, the people who are making the decisions actually need to be engaged in that process from beginning to end. So goal and scope. Um, that's as simple as saying to a group of people who have a stake in a given question, what do you want to know? Um, how are we going to measure um, the sustainability, if you will, of one technology or service option versus another? Um, are you worried about climate? Are you worried about solid waste? Are you worried about air pollution? It may be that you're worried about all the above, but you need to sit down and get people to understand exactly what it is they want measured in the study. Um, and perhaps more importantly than that, you need to ask them, what does the system look like that you want to study? Um, and that's usually a question that the scientific experts go ahead and establish for themselves. So let me go through an example of, of my own in terms of a study that I've done um, looking at a sustainability issue for biofuels. So here's the example that, that I want to I wanna look at and I can kind of walk you through some of the steps in doing the life cycle and some of the findings that we, that we found. Um, the conventional life cycle approach um, I'm showing here is for a, a process of collecting corn stover from uh, a farmer's field, um, transporting that to a biofuels conversion facility um, where it is turned into fuel ethanol. It goes into the distribution system and it gets used. Here's the, it's a, it's a pretty conventional way of looking at the supply chain for ethanol that gets delivered to somebody's car. Um, and as I've already indicated, Typical LCAs are focused on labeling a, a supply chain like this as either being good or bad. And for those of you who are familiar with corn ethanol, you will know that uh, life cycle calculations of the net energy balance for corn ethanol um, have been flying through the press and through the peer-reviewed literature for two or three decades. Um, each of which makes its own claim about whether or not there's a net gain in energy uh, in this case uh, or a savings in greenhouse gas emissions associated with corn ethanol. Well, we wanted to look at that question for this use of corn stover, which is a very different material. If you're not familiar with it, corn stover is the residue that farmers leave in the field after they have gone ahead and harvested the corn grain from their field. So it's something that can be viewed as uh, effectively a, a waste material that's thrown back on the, uh, on the ground, uh, and a lot of which ends up rotting and um, being re-emitted back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. The problem with the way we've gone into these life cycles in the past is that they're a static snapshot, as I say, a tendency to want to say, well, is it good with this technology or without this technology? Are we more sustainable or less sustainable? Um, but the problem is ecosystems that we're working in, including the ecosystem of a farmer's field, is not a static system. It's a very dynamic system with um, lots of potential 
uh, for unintended consequences in the system that need to be captured. Um, and it's also not black and white. Um, and we chose to look at this system in a very dynamic way. Um, and part of doing that process was sitting down with stakeholders across a whole range of interests, people from the petroleum industry, um, farmers, uh, uh, current biofuels producers, auto automobile makers who are interested in having access to a sustainable fuel. And we asked them all to tell us what should we be measuring in this system and how should we think about the system. So the first big thing that came out of this group that was kind of interesting to us and not something we necessarily uh, had on the table was they said, look, um, corn stover um, is something that you're basically saying we're going to let farmers continue to do what they're doing and leave that on the ground. Or you're going to ask them to collect some of it, in which case we get to recycle the carbon in that corn stover and use it for fuel. Um, but they actually said, look, you could also view the farmers as having two kinds of options for becoming managers of carbon emissions. Um, in one case, uh, they switch from whatever current set of practices they're doing to a set of management practices that actually allow carbon to be stored in the soil and therefore reducing net greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. Um, that's an option we call making the farmers, um, turning them into sequesterers of carbon. Um, or we can collect that stover, or at least some of it, um, use it to make fuel, um, run it through a car so we can get some use out of it, and then have that carbon released back into the atmosphere and then recycled in the next year's uh, harvest or production of corn. Um, and the question from them was, which of those is a more sustainable use of the farmer's field? So I'm not going to get into the real details of the system that they helped us construct, but I want to show you this drawing of how they envisioned the system because it's a great example of how the stakeholders sitting down up front with no real experience in doing a life cycle assessment could point us as researchers toward a design of that system that we were not thinking about. Um, so again, they were looking at it as, gee, this is a system in which farmers could be changing how they're doing things, and we want to understand the implications of that. This is a system in which we need to understand the full life cycle implications of producing and using the petroleum gasoline alternative. Um, we need to understand all of the environmental uh, impacts and energy impacts of the whole supply chain to delivering, um, say, a mile traveled, which was our, our functional unit for comparing these systems. And then it gets even more subtle. There can be co-products. In this case, there could be a co-product of electricity that is generated at the conversion facility. Well, we have to take into account the effect that this introducing this system has on changing the broader uh, electricity generation system by making it more sustainable because we've avoided the use of things like coal and natural gas to produce that electricity. Um, and I guess I just want to highlight the idea that drawing the system boundaries is a big trick and it's a function of what the purpose of the discussion is. And this is something that, that uh, Dana Meadows pointed out in a wonderful, wonderful book uh, on systems thinking that she wrote uh, shortly before she passed away. Um, she is one of the great and wisest thinkers about systems um, that I have ever come across and certainly somebody who's writing um, I think um, should be finding its way actually into the high schools because she's such a sound and solid thinker. Um, so without getting into the numbers of what we found, when we compared the effect of collecting the corn stover with its potential problems on the soil, um, taking away carbon from the soil, um, what we found was that, okay, the, the two options the farmers have, if they just use the stover as a way through management changes of storing carbon, um, they have a short-term benefit to the environment. But the problem is it's only short-term. 
um, we use dynamic ecosystem models of the soil to understand um, how the farmers' fields were actually responding to the changes in management. Um, and over a 30 to 40 to 50 year period, um, there was a, a storage of carbon that occurs, but it eventually dissipates. It eventually goes away as the soil comes to a new equilibrium. And what we found is if it's done properly and you use that stover for biofuels, um, there are actually long-term consistent uh, reductions in fossil CO2 um, that significantly outweigh any um, lost opportunity for storing that carbon in the soil. Now, this all sounds very arcane, but going into the study, the idea of using corn stover was exceedingly controversial. There were environmental groups and there were many researchers in the U.S. Department of Agriculture who said, you will collect that corn stover over my dead body because that stuff serves an extremely important role. And that role is that it actually, it actually protects the soil and helps in this process of sequestering soil. Um, Do you see the question from, there's a question in the chat box from Logan. Okay, so it was better in the short term to sequester carbon in the soil, but the soil became maxed out with the amount of carbon it could hold. And then the benefit is lost in the long term. That's, that's a correct um, translation of what I'm, uh, or interpretation of what I'm saying. Um, the dynamics of soil are such that, um, gee, you know, especially if it's soil that was very low in organic matter, um, it would soak up as much carbon as it could, um, but eventually it would saturate. Um, and you could not get any more carbon in there. So the, the benefits of using the soil to store carbon um, was really uh, only a temporary or a transient one. Whereas the ability to recycle the, the carbon and avoid fossil use in a car um, was a consistent long-term benefit um, that, that was maintained. Um, it's also, there's another important caveat in all this, and that is that it has to be done properly. Um, it is very possible to collect too much corn stover off of the field, in which case you can begin to damage the soil and it will lose its productivity, it will lose organic carbon, it will suffer from soil erosion because it doesn't have enough material sitting on top to protect it from the erosion associated with wind and rainfall. Um, especially after harvest, so you can go too far. Now, I mentioned before there were people who started out saying that stover removal was just not going to happen on their watch. One of those people was a fellow named uh, Wally Wilhelm, um, and he was a soil scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture who spent the better part of his career actually um, defending the idea that corn stover serves an important function and that it should not be um, removed from the soil. Uh, he was one of those over my dead body types. And he was one of our stakeholders in these discussions. And I remember uh, he sent me an email after the study was completed in which he basically said, you know, I heard this guy from DOE, the Department of Energy, get up and say, um, we can have this corn stover and, and basically use it without any, uh, any harmful impacts and use it to make fuels. And he, you know, he said, I thought he'd been out in the sun too long without a hat. But he, came, he went on to say that he came to see that this was a matter of how the system was actually operated and that there were responsible ways to do this and in effect that everybody was right. Um, if you take too much stover, you're going to have, you're going to cause harm. Um, if you manage it properly, you can do it without causing harm and actually having some benefit. Um, so I, I see it as one of those opportunities where we bridged what seemed like, um, you know, absolutely disparate points of view that could not be, uh, could not be connected. So now let me take the, the systems thinking one more level in terms of both the complexity of its dynamics for biofuels and um, the scope and breadth of the actual system we study, 
There was a paper published in 2007, I think, uh, in Science uh, Magazine, in which it was declared that not only was corn ethanol itself not a very effective uh, way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but that it had huge unanticipated global implications uh, for land use change that would in itself cause even more severe carbon emission problems um, and therefore um, this was absolutely the worst possible and least sustainable approach to replacing gasoline. Um, that caused a firestorm uh, in the research community. Folks in the biofuels industry um, felt like they were completely caught off guard by this and fundamentally um, what I like about this study is that it raised an aspect of how to think about the system. Remember I said Dana Meadows made the comment that you need to look at the, the boundaries of this system in terms of the purpose of the discussion. Um, in the case of looking at biofuels, it's now becoming increasingly evident that you have to have a global scope to that system, um, that you have to broaden the implications of what you're doing when you introduce biofuels to a level um, that people had not been doing um, and that's what this paper did. Fundamentally what it was saying was there are some dynamics going on here. If I use good agricultural land to, to produce corn and then I use that corn to make fuel instead of using it in the food system, I'm going to encourage people to clear land for more corn production somewhere else on the planet. Um, now the question is how you model that effectively and, and there were certainly lots of details about how the Science Magazine study was done um, that raised questions. Um, but as a systems thinker, um, I jumped into it and said, oh, okay, well this is great. This is really a dynamic system in which we can now expand the system from just looking at what's going on in the farmer's own field to how the farmer's choices for for his or her field interact with the rest of the global land stock that's being used for agriculture. And fundamentally what this means is that you have a dynamic process in which if land has to be made up to deliver um, corn for food um, because that corn was diverted to energy, um, then there will be a clearing of land that causes a huge release of carbon. Fundamentally, and people, I'm sure you've all seen films of this, um, areas like the Amazon, um, the way they get cleared for agriculture is they're set on fire. And those fires release a huge amount of carbon dioxide. This is the unanticipated or unintended consequence um, that was being identified in this science study. So I decided to look at it with some very simple systems modeling in which I could look at that effect of balancing the demand for agricultural land, um, which is a function of lots of things. It's a function of total population, it's a function of the economic um, level of um, or the economic well-being of the population, it's a function of how effective uh, the yields for agriculture are, all sorts of things that go into this. Um, and I looked at that and said, what happens if we do a little experiment in a system model instead of trying the experiment out for real and we look at what happens if we divert land into producing energy. Um, what, what happens? Um, what is the trade-off there if we go from zero to 16 billion gallons of cellulosic ethanol in this case, which by the way is a current target of the United States and its policies uh, in the Renewable Fuels Act uh, that was passed some years back. So when I looked at the dynamics of this system in terms of how the science study was done, what came, became clear to me is that that study was done using what I call the ceteris paribus experiment paradigm. Basically, this is someone who sat down and said, everything else about the global agriculture system is going to be held frozen and I'm going to introduce a new fuel. Now, if I freeze everything as it currently looks, say, in the year 2007, um, some bizarre things happen. 
Um, the amount of land that his model would predict is required to meet demands for a growing population explodes. In fact, it explodes at a level that makes no sense in terms of our own experience historically with how land use uh, has looked since uh, we started collecting uh, global agriculture data in 1960. Um, that was the first sort of wake-up call to the modelers that, oh, well, maybe this wasn't the best systems approach to it. When we built in an accounting for what else was going on in the system, like yields were improving every year, um, and even if we accounted for increased demands coming from a growing population, um, our model suggested that land demand was actually going to hit a peak in about 30 or 40 years and it would begin to decline. Well, then these supposed land clearing effects no longer exist. Um, and that was what we built into the system. So when we looked at it on a life cycle basis and we looked at the net savings associated with um, uh, avoiding fossil carbon by burning biofuels instead of burning gasoline, um, and we compared that to potential land use change impacts. Um, under the constant yield scenario, which is that Ceteris Paribus case that was published in Science, um, what we saw was that the introduction of a demand of 16 billion gallons for new cellulosic ethanol would cause this huge burst of carbon to be released and we would generate effectively a huge debt of carbon um, that eventually we would start paying off because we, we at the same time we released a huge amount of carbon at the start we began saving fossil carbon emissions or avoiding carbon emissions from fossil fuel um, as we displaced the petroleum sources for fuel. Um, the problem was that that debt under the Ceteris Paribus, the constant yield case, was so huge that you'd never pay it back. Um, when we broadened that system to account for other things that were going on, what we found was that there was a carbon debt being generated um, by introducing this new demand for fuel, um, but that it wasn't nearly as large and that it could eventually be paid off in a time frame after which we'd begin to get net savings very different picture um, from what was painted as the disastrous carbon debt um, in, you see in the blue line there. Well, I showed this result to uh, somebody uh, at, at a, um, and I, a shall be unnamed uh, environmental NGO and they said this can't be right. You've got something wrong here. First of all, your model is telling me that eventually, 30, 40 years from now, we'll be using less land for agriculture than we are now. And I know that's wrong because my experience tells me that land is getting cleared every year, that the Amazon is being um, encroached on by agriculture. So how can you possibly be saying otherwise? Um, well, um, that's the point of doing these models is to say, look, do I have this right? Am I thinking about the system properly? So we went back to the original model that I looked at and we thought about, well, what things are we missing? And the thing that we discovered we were missing was that there is a lot of land that is being lost from the agricultural system because it's being badly managed. And this degraded land eventually becomes so poor in terms of its productivity that it gets abandoned. So in essence, we discovered that we were missing what was a major source of land leakage in the system um, that had to be made up for. So sort of to make the long story that's already too long a little bit shorter, if we go back and we look at the original results I had compared uh, in my historical results compared with what was in the science uh, magazine article, and we corrected our model for this other effect, we ended up discovering that our carbon debt calculations were almost as bad as the ones that were published in science. But we learned something new from a systems perspective. We learned that the causes of that are more complex than just the direct effect of introducing ethanol um, uh, demand uh, in the agricultural sector, um, but it's also related to 
in effect a very unsustainable global agriculture system. So this actually raises ethical and political questions about who should be held responsible for that carbon debt. Should a new industry that is using bioenergy to recycle carbon be asked to carry the burden of the rest of the global system that's broken? Um, I don't want to give an answer to that question, but I at least want to be able to raise it as an analyst. Um, so I'm actually going to wrap up here because I, I, I kind of said I wasn't going to, uh, I was going to try to leave some time here at the end. But my, my point in closing is that um, these systems are more than just doing some accounting and for scientists to sit off in a corner and do a study somewhere. Um, they raise issues that are of tremendous societal importance and they require an engagement of people because of that in the upfront design and execution of the studies. Um, these are the kinds of things that I've done. Um, in the banner project that you are all participating in, um, we're going to be doing this kind of analysis to ask the question of whether or not um, collecting and using uh, beetle kill uh, from uh, forest land in the West um, and converting it into energy in some form is actually sustainable and we need to go through this whole process of looking at the full system and its full implications uh, both globally um, and uh, from a natural ecosystem point of view. So with, with that I'm going to stop yammering and uh, let other people ask questions. John, do you have any update on where the banner project is in that process? Um, my understanding is that uh, a very preliminary analysis has been done, um, but we're just getting organized now um, to put together the process as I've described it using the ISO standards um, process um, of putting together a stakeholder group. Um, there actually was a webinar that was done um, in which we ask for initial input and I'm sure that we can get that. That's now posted uh, as a YouTube um, video as well and is something that you can have a look at to understand what some responses were from stakeholders that we uh, invited uh, to that particular discussion. Um, but we're going to come... Is on our YouTube station? Uh, I presume so, but okay. we, can, cool. we can do that. I'll ask, ask John. Ask. I've thrown a lot at people and uh, I always feel like it's uh, coming at people like trying to drink out of a fire hose but sometimes it takes a, a minute for people to start typing or unmute nope. themselves are you are you using planning to be using all the tasks, different tasks, da as data sources? Um, yes, they. A lot of them will will be providing data um, on the actual forest impacts. Trying to understand what are it's 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 just as important to understand what's the effect of not doing anything with this beetle kill, as much as it is understanding. Um, what are the implications for forest health uh, that are for using some of that material? Are there other studies that have been um, LCAs that have been done in this area before, or is this I'm, pretty I'm brand not, new? Yeah, I'm not actually aware of any that have been done um, on the particular issue for, for beetle kill. Um, what's interesting is that life cycle studies that have looked at the general question of using trees and forest products as a source of energy have generally concluded that it's a bad idea. Um, and it's for one of the reasons that was described above in the study for corn stover and that is if you have a standing forest that has been effectively storing carbon for 50 to 100 years and you suddenly take all that carbon and use it for energy and release it to the atmosphere you're going to generate a new debt and that debt will be hard to pay off. 
um, it becomes a very different and more subtle question when you start looking at systems in which there have been things like beetle kill um, because these systems are now starting to rot uh, and release CO2 on their own anyway and it's that kind of thing that we need to look at plus um, leaving them alone um, results in catastrophic fires in many cases and those fires themselves are an immediate source of CO2 so looking at it from the, the point of view of this specific issue, uh, I, would, I would say there, there isn't anything out there that's been done. New ground. <laughs> Will you be looking at, I'm, I'm like filling the silence, so please type <laughs> things, other people, but um, will you be, will the project be looking at biochar as part of the LCA as well? Yes, yes, that's, that's another option. And there again, you're looking at the opportunity for something like biochar as a byproduct of a bioenergy process um, as a source of sequestering carbon in soil again. Um, and having an additional benefit from that. At the annual meeting, John Field was talking about like the decision model. Is that related at all to the life cycle analysis or is that a separate part of the project? I think the life cycle effort um, is one component of, of a decision support tool. Um, you actually need to understand the full life cycle implications of changes you make. Um, so in addition to the, the broader economics of uh, how we manage the forest and how we use that material, um, the life cycle part of the study will bring some of the environmental and sustainability issues um, to, to bear on the question. So it's it's a part, the short answer is it's, it's a part of that that tool. Last chance for questions, folks. I gotta thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yes, that I that was great. It was very very useful, I thought. It's interesting. One comment I will make is that um, from the point of view, you know, life cycle assessment is basically the underlying approach to people calculating their own carbon footprints. Um, I think these kinds of calculations can be as simple or as complicated as you want them to be um, and encouraging students to actually find ways uh, of doing these calculations looking for the information to determine their own carbon footprint is a great is a great exercise all right so here's a question so is the jury still out on disposable diapers um, I think in the public debate the jury is still out. Um, my sense is that the answer uh, is somewhat clear. Um, if your concern is uh, energy consumption uh, and water consumption, uh, dis disposables are better. If your concern is solid waste, they are not. And I don't think that uh, I don't think that situation has changed in spite of the fact that there is this group out there out there now really claiming that uh, um, there's no debate about which is more sustainable and in their view it's the, it's the cloth diapers. Kind of like the uh, kind of like the climate change debate, you know, it's the jury's never quite out um, regardless of uh, maybe how far along the science has come. That's not me, by the way. That's a different, somehow three people have my name now. 
Maybe it was Sylvia. <laughs> what okay. were some factors that um, were affected when uh, soil will be maxed out in oh which which affect when soil will be maxed out uh, in terms of storing carbon? One is the climate that you're in. Um, cooler climates tend to have an ability um, to uh, allow soils to store more carbon um, than warmer climates. Um, so that's one big issue. Um, another issue is, um, yes, and, and so the question is, is that due to slower decomposition rates? That's exactly, that's exactly the case. Um, one of the problems with uh, uh, corn stover is that 80% of the carbon that's in it is great food for microbes. Um, and in warm temperature conditions, uh, even if you try to prevent the microbes from eating that carbon um, uh, by, by using a no-till system, um, they will eventually just, just consume it the, the warmer it is. So uh, that's, that's a major issue. Um, it's also a function of, of, of what the previous set of conditions were. So if you were already a farmer doing no-till, um, your soil may already be maxed out, and um, there is no there is no opportunity to offset uh, the effects of removing carbon along with the stover. Um, in a scenario like that, um, there will be at least a transient loss in in soil carbon and a transient release of CO2 from the soil to the atmosphere that has to be dealt with. Um, so it's it's as important to know what the history of that soil is as it is to know what it is you plan to do with it um, down the road. And another thanks, you're welcome. Thank you, John. Okay. We are going to, we'll post you, oh, one more question from Logan. With many degraded soils, there seems to be lots of opportunity to increase carbon sequestration. That, that is exactly the case. Um, I think one of the opportunities for, um, for farmland that is on the verge of being lost because it's so degraded is that it is so starved for carbon that some basic changes in nutrient management uh, as well as tilling practices um, could restore that soil to, to a usable state and in that process actually uh, increase the amount of carbon uh, that can get stored. So again, that it's the more degraded it is, the farther it is away from what its maximum potential is. So yes, those are those are huge opportunities. Is that in the Context of um, agriculture or forestry or both or it's actually both. Um, as there is a lot of pasture land, for example, that is also highly degraded. Um, and if it, if the management practices on that pasture land were changed, you'd see an opportunity for that land to begin sequestering carbon. Fascinating. Kind of an interesting set of trade-offs because one of the issues is that one of the reasons why soil gets degraded is because a lot of poor farmers don't use fertilizer. Um, but if you get them using fertilizer, then the fertilizer itself uh, causes um, is based on fossil energy, which has its own carbon debt. And the balancing act is: can you use a little bit of fossil-based fertilizer? to improve the health of the soil um, and offset the fossil carbon with sequestered soil carbon. John, can you hear me? Yes. So I was just a uh, really interesting topic because we have a ranch at home and we've been meeting with soil scientists and stuff. Um, is, is that one of the problems with, say, a carbon credit program is like if somebody's been taking incredibly good care of their soils for a long time and there's no potential for improving it, then it's essentially they're being punished because now they can't get some kind of credit for improving it? 
that that's exactly that's exactly the case. It's a it's a classic case of you know no good deed will go unpunished. Um, you know it, it's as you look at <clears throat> at changes in soil carbon. Um, you know the the folks who have been good stewards um, are are really put in a bad position. And then uh, with that. Uh, so you said the lack of use of fertilizers can cause those soils to become degraded. So production levels decrease, therefore um, there's a net movement of carbon out of the soil. Is that what they're seeing? Yeah, you end up you end up stripping the carbon out of the soil, and then you also um, you also it, it as it becomes less productive, eventually it just gets abandoned it, with nothing growing on it. Um, it also becomes vulnerable to soil erosion. So there's a there's a whole set of sort of vicious cycles that, that take place um, when farmers effectively are mining the nitrogen and other nutrients out of the soil uh, without replacing them. And I'm assuming that although they're probably more expensive or more time intensive, there probably are other options besides fossil fuel fertilizers, but the, the cost and time and management are probably the issues there. Um, you know, I think I think there there are actually part of my PhD that I did uh, that I just finished last year um, was looking at farmers in Southwest Minnesota um, who were beginning to reincorporate animals and animal manure back into their their corn production systems, um, and that has tremendous opportunities for both increasing the the soil carbon sequestration and improving the performance of the of the land um, so it can be done I think I think the biggest issue is that when you look at the system more broadly we have shifted from a system where animals and crop production went on together in the same place to one in which animals are now sort of isolated in their own confined feedlots um, not necessarily anywhere near where the crop production occurs. Um, and You've taken as a long solution as and made it two problems. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this is a case where the unintended consequence was that you took away an opportunity for more sustainable, um, you know, nutrient management um, by by moving toward this more quote unquote efficient uh, confined feedlot system. And by the way, life cycle calculations of a confined feedlot will show you that it has lower greenhouse gas emissions than grass-fed uh, pasture beef. Um, and you know, so there are all sorts of ironies here in terms of uh, how these systems end up looking, um, just because of other changes that have been made in, in how we how we conduct agriculture. So, sorry, and I know you're staying late for me here. Um, so you said that the life cycle assessment says that uh, the, the feedlot's actually uh, less CO2 emissions, right? Yep. And so and is, that, is that not taking into account, let's say, fertilizers you may or may not have to add, or is that kind of taking account into everything? Um, I'm just kind of curious about, about that. Well, the, study, the studies I've looked at are pretty comprehensive, so they have looked at everything, including the penalties of using fertilizer to grow the crops that are, the grains that are fed to the animals. Um, the big problem turns out to be that in grass-fed systems, animals take longer to reach their full weight, and the longer they're out in the field, the more they burp methane out into the environment and that methane is a potent greenhouse gas. So that's the issue that really becomes a problem for the grass-fed beef. That's so sad. <laughs> well, it, it, it really is, and I don't think it has, to, it, it, it has to necessarily be that way. I think there are, as I say, when, if you look at the system as it currently looks, um, you know, the answer is confined feedlots look, look quote-unquote, better. Um, but then again, you know, there's all sorts of other issues: the the, the well-being and health of the animals, um, the use of other, you know, other chemicals and antibiotics. These are all things that that need to be considered um, when someone decides what is more sustainable um, in the choice of these systems. 
one of which might be uh, soil health in the long term. Exactly right. Uh, what study is that? So that might be my last question before I leave you alone. Can you tell me what study that was? At the confined feedlot versus grass systems uh, was done by a researcher named Nathan Pelletier in Canada, um, P-E-L-L-E-T-I-E-R. Um, somehow or other, I can probably get that reference to you. Um, it's, it's actually a reasonably well done study. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if you send that to me, I'll, I'll share it um, okay. on our base camp. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Logan. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this off because I still got my All right. son at daycare. <laughs> so thank you. thank you so much, John, and thanks for your great questions too, Logan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>